we will get started. And this is another installment of the COVID Silver Lining series. Uh, I think we all recognize the impact that COVID-19 has had on our work. Um, however, due to program adaptations and, and clever pivots, HIV services have been provided to those most at risk on prevention methods. And today we're gonna to talk about PrEP. The series will look at uh, things that we've learned from the pandemic and try to find positive impacts that we can hold on to and, and carry forward. Um, and you know, the title here is based on the, the saying, even the darkest clouds have, have silver lining. So again, my name is Sean Marr. I'm a senior HIV advisor with JSI's HIV and Infectious Disease Center. And I'm lucky enough to be joined today by Mwanza and Dr. Mutinta from our USAID Discover Health Project in Zambia. I'll let them both introduce themselves before we dive into the conversation. Dr. Mutinta, you first. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, my name is Mutinta Nyumbu. I'm the Deputy Project uh, Director in charge of uh, prevention and behavior interventions at USAID Discover Health. And um, my name is Mwansanjela Sani Kaira. I'm the Senior Advisor, Prevention and Behavior Interventions at uh, USA Discover Health. Super, thanks again to both of you for joining today. And my first question is just to kind of set the stage for our listeners on the impacts that COVID-19 has had to life and programming in Zambia, um, specifically to HIV prevention and treatment. How have the lockdowns, curfews, other kind of mitigation measures um, affected your work and program activities? Um, maybe I could start. Um, yes, COVID definitely has hit us very badly here in Zambia. Uh, this We are in our third wave right now, and each wave had its own consequences. Uh, most of the time, because we have our programs are outside Lusaka, uh, outside the capital city, we have to go out in the community and uh, in each of these waves, uh, we had to stop uh, people traveling outside. And when you stop people traveling outside, it means that your work cannot be done uh, properly. Uh, so you miss out. Uh, we have to fulfill, we have to get the services out there to the Zambian people. Uh, but because of the COVID, uh, we found people were actually uh, at the community itself, we could not even go out. Our community health workers would not let them go out in the communities as well, including ourselves here, including the people even in the health centers, in the health facilities. Uh, but having said that, um, it looks like you know once a program has started, it just rolls on. Uh, because we have realized with the data that is coming out, we are not too far behind uh, our targets. So that's really good for us and it's very, very surprising in these challenging times. That's fantastic to hear that your work has continued and, and continuing to achieve the targets. Mwanza, how has your team responded to some of the lockdown um, and other mitigation measures that Dr. Mutinta just raised, you know, vis-a-vis -vis travel, et cetera? Sure. Um, so, um, one of the things that, um, so the, the Discover Health Project uh, for Context provides both, um, it provides um, integrated HIV prevention services really in communities. And, um, and uh, our core strength has been, especially when we look at the PrEP program, has been our capacity to, to go out and um, go out into communities and be able to provide services in, in those spaces. So one of the things that we had to do was really limit the, 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 the capacity, like Dr. Nyumbo had said, of people to be able to go out. But well, some of the things that we'll do is then really focus on um, our existing clients. Um, so for example, within the PrEP program, um, giving them um, um, multi-month uh, uh, drugs versus uh, uh, PrEP drugs for several months versus um, just um, uh, yeah, just monthly instead of monthly, um, really using technology to our advantage. I was just looking at the stats. Um, just this past quarter, we sent out over 180,000 messages, so automated messages and our messaging system uh, to really support clients and follow up with them wow. and seeing how they are. Um, also, uh, just within within our um, 
our facilities at Swell from a clinical perspective, one of the things that they did is to reconfigure health facilities as well in, in the way in which our client flow um, happens so as to really reduce the risk uh, to both our providers as well as the clients coming through. Um, and uh, providing PPE to community health workers that still have to continue providing the services and making sure that we adhere to the COVID-19 guidelines as we provide these services. So um, having um, distanced health talks and that sort of thing. So it's been um, a steep learning curve. And like Dr. Nyumbo has said, with each wave um, and as we've gone ahead, uh, as we've gone forward, we've had to really change and pivot um, just to try and maintain and ensure that people continue to access the services. And despite that, like Dr. Nyumbu has said, um, and I think it's also a reflection on the strength of the PrEP program really, um, clients have been coming in. So we're still, whilst we have, our focus has really been on uh, existing clients and, and then also uh, our continued um, sensitization through social media and so on, uh, clients are still coming through our doors, new clients that continue to come through our doors. And our stats speak to that as well um, in terms of uh, almost reaching our targets, um, our, our yearly targets uh, here at SAPR. That's fantastic. Uh, it's really encouraging to hear that your volume of clients on PrEP hasn't really diminished during this, uh, as we know, just because we're in a pandemic does not mean the earlier epidemic um, has, has ended. So some of the some of the interventions you mentioned, like use of technology and multi-month dispensing for PrEP, were these in the works before the pandemic? And has COVID, did COVID fast track these initiatives? Um, I think uh, it's something that we had already started on and thank God we did that even from uh, right uh, much, much earlier and then when COVID started. Uh, so like the use of technology uh, is something that we actually started right at the beginning of, uh, of the program when we started PrEP. Uh, we realized that I think technology was very important in whatever we're doing. And it, at this I just to say thank you to Mansa because she has been very, very instrumental in that. Uh, so with that has been going on. So prep, when COVID came on, it just became a plus for us. Uh, so, and yes, and even the amount uh, month uh, dispensing as it was going on even before, uh, but I think for now, as COVID came, we just saw the importance of actually having that and it continued even strongly uh, because it was very helpful. That's great that you had the foundation and the infrastructure already built to, um, mm -hmm. to leverage when, when COVID-19 hit. Do you, Mwanza, in, letting... your, oh, in your perspective, sure. Oh, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say, I think it's also a reflection of the Discover Health model. Um, really, um, I, I, I've counted it as a privilege to work within this, this um, uh, type of um, uh, project because firstly, the donor, themselves have been so flexible, um, have been really open to enabling, discover, find the best mechanisms to ensure that we reach the clients as best as we can. And so I think the built-in flexibility of the Discover Health model has enabled us to be able to um, make course corrections to respond to emerging challenges. And so, um, so, so for me, that has been that. Has been that. Also, um, just even where we are, the fact that we're so close to communities um, and the relationship that uh, providers and the community health workers have developed because of this closeness to communities has really facilitated that um, enable, again, were the bedrocks of, of enabling us to make the shifts so that they're able to call the clients, tell them that, you know, we're changing the strategy, et cetera. So, so I really think it's a reflection of um, the model, but also the kind of relationships, um, because ultimately our program is really built on those 600 plus people that run these programs and the type of relationships that they've cultivated in these, um, within the communities across the country. So, so I think it's really a reflection of that um, um, 
and, and just the maturity of the program itself. We've really learned lessons as we've gone along and it's enabled us to then shift and turn um, quite, uh, quite rapidly um, uh, despite, despite the challenges that, um, and the difficult working environment that we have been working in. But also maybe to add to that, uh, I think the resilience of our healthcare providers, uh, despite all the COVID that has been going on, uh, they have been on their feet. I mean, we have had definitely some of our healthcare providers falling sick uh, because of COVID, uh, but management also just to say thank you to our management here. Uh, they really went, got ahead and took care of those health healthcare workers. Uh, so I think credit, a lot of credit goes to our healthcare workers who are out there. The providers, the healthcare, the, the healthcare workers in the community, the providers themselves, and everybody, community mobilization officers, all those people who were on the ground, who never stayed at home, working from home, they just stood there and were on the ground and uh, the three waves are passed and they are still standing. And I think we give them a lot of credit. That's terrific. Thank you for, for giving them credit. You know, we, um, we don't have a program without the providers. So they are critical and, and, and I appreciate your statements there. But also Mwanza, your nod to the program design and the relationship with the donor also critical. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned the integrated nature of the program in the community. You know, as you both know, and, and many of our listeners and people who follow JSI's work will know, this entire prep program was built on a human-centered design approach where we really did listen to the end user, solicit as much feedback about their barriers and facilitators to accessing and, and staying on prep. So Mwanza, let me ask you, during this during the pandemic, have you reached out to, uh, to community members, PrEP users, and has there been any sort of um, bi-directional communication in, in, in how we've adapted the program? So um, I, I think, um, like you have said, the initial research really around the PrEP program was so fundamental to what we did and it shifted Honestly, it, it, even for us as programmers, it really shifted our mindset and our thinking around that. So even as we've gone and made these changes in terms of um, um, just trying to uh, ensure that PrEP clients still receive the services as they should and so on, it, it has to take that back and forth uh, so that they're able to understand why we're making the changes. And um, like, like, um, um, like we've mentioned, it has also maintained that stability of the program itself. So, so I think, um, how would I say, perhaps not on a formal level in sense in terms of doing formative research or that sort of thing, but built within the program itself is really around that engagement with the client and making sure that our program remains responsive to their needs. And, and one of the key needs was their safety. And so changing from uh, the, 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 the shorter period of time of, of providing them with service, um, providing them with drugs to a longer period of time, but also communicating with them through um, the really strengthening the role of the case manager, the community health worker in following up with the clients um, and ensuring that despite um, that they come through for their uh, uh, for their um, refills and so on. So, so not necessarily at a formative level, but within um, the program, built within the program has been this sort of, there's a need for that back and forth with the client. Maybe also to add that uh, even uh, from our headquarters here, I think there's a lot of support that has been going on, despite uh, us not being able to go out in the field. Uh, the people from headquarters have been giving a lot of support. Uh, and so technology, I think technology has really played a very big role in this. So that because each, whether you are, it's a key pops, whether it's prisons, whether it's dreams, there's somebody who is in charge of that. So we have got somebody who is in charge of dreams, somebody who is in charge of key populations, we've got somebody who, who, are, who is in charge of each and every uh, program. And we make sure that on a weekly basis, they get in touch 
they give support to those people who are out there in the community and they also get to hear any challenges that they are facing and we have like a monthly meeting be like for as as um uh, prevention team we have a monthly meeting with the um community mobilization officers the ones who are actually in charge and work with the with the community health workers out there so with they give feedback and they present uh, whatever they have done during the month to each other and they were giving each other support. So all this has actually contributed uh, to strengthening and giving support to each other and knowing that they are actually, they are not alone when they are in the field, mm -hmm. uh, that people from Lusaka are actually with them. And this has helped and it has kept us in touch. And, and maybe just to add to that as well, um, one of the things that um, the clinical team introduced was having weekly meetings. Initially, it was just the clinical staff. So again, that um, link between the, 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 the hubs, so the regional teams and the provincial, the district teams and the HQ to really understand what are some of the issues they're facing. But what we eventually have done is that we brought in supply chain um, ourselves as a prevention team. I've also joined so that on a weekly basis, we look at prep numbers, we disaggregate and we understand. So where are the challenges? And it's been such a informative and um, inspiring forum again. So we have both spaces just for the mobilizers themselves, but also as a team um, going from the, the community mobilization and prevention team through to the clinical and supply chain, because one of the things that we found, one of the consequences we found of COVID um, has been that the, the, there's been a shortage at a national level of PrEP drugs. But through this forum, you find that people will be saying, okay, actually um, in this province, uh, we have some drugs. So maybe we can shift and send them through to you and, and that sort of thing. So that has really helped with the programming and just to help with um, troubleshoot before, um, you know, before you get to the end of the, you know, um, the line, you're able then to say, um, let's work together, let's support each other, despite the challenges we're facing, there is that one, two things that we can do to really try and move the PrEP program in particular. Wanza, I'm glad that you mentioned the drug redistribution among, um, among facilities and, and, and districts. That brings me to think about the national level response. So the government of Zambia, how are they looking at you know, interventions like multi-month dispensing for PrEP and what, what would we need to do to support them or support policy changes to, to keep this going after the pandemic? Uh, we we don't, um, like our section doesn't really work directly with the Minister of Health, uh, but we have the supply chain uh, component within our, our uh, within Discover. And uh, so far, I think we have had, uh, the challenge that we've had is what Mwansa has, has actually talked about. Uh, the fact that uh, the drugs have not been flowing as they were supposed to have flown to be done in the beginning. We're not getting in drugs. Uh, that drilled us a bit, uh, but it's, uh, I think it's beyond everybody's, uh, uh, it's not a discover fault. Uh, you don't even know whether it's even, we can even call it a Minister of Health fault. Uh, so that I would not tell right now, you know, what would have been happening in once. I don't know whether you do be able to, to shed even a, a bit of light on that, but I don't know, I wouldn't uh, say something on that. Maybe, um, maybe the only thing um, that I can speak to is uh, at national level, we do have the PrEP task force. And one of the things that we do bring up are some of the challenges, but also the innovations that have been happening as a result of, um, of uh, COVID. And, and I think that gives a space of, because we are giving the, the, the evidence of what can happen, like the multi-months um, in an ideal situation where you have drugs, um, like multi-months dispensing of PrEP drugs, for example, uh, and even looking at some of the regulations, I know like, for example, with WHO and whether or not we need to do some of the, the, the tests 
if they're, they're truly necessary, um, some of them at um, um, in line with some of the protocols that have been happening, I think it provides a space where um, as, as, as maybe the waves that, because right now we've really been fighting through the third, the, the waves of COVID. And maybe as, as, as we start to live with COVID, uh, we can start now looking more at a strategic level to say, what are some of the policy shifts that can happen? The other thing is also, interestingly enough, um, we are finding, for example, uh, people are starting to try and access drugs through pharmacies. The, the prep drugs, but that's not policy right now. But you see it on so so when we look at um, when we've been tracking social media, we've been finding that some people um, are trying to yeah access prep through pharmacies and the private um, the private sector more. And I think there's a space there as well where we can look at some of these type of innovations, bring it to the fore of the task force um, that we're part of, and really try and move the needle around um, increasing access through different type of spaces, but also innovations around service delivery as well, um, based on the evidence we've generated in um, within this very difficult space that we're operating in. That sounds exciting to engage the private sector for prep distribution. I think that's definitely um, definitely on the horizon. Well, let me wrap up with just one last question. Um, I, I want to be respectful of your time. It's a little bit outside of what we've been talking about, but but looking forward and kind of leveraging what we've learned from the COVID nineteen response. How do you see some of the lessons we've learned here and with PrEP in general, uh, applying to the introduction and rollout of new HIV prevention methods, uh, specifically the biomedical interventions we see like the Depivirin vaginal ring uh, and injectable PrEP? Um, how, can we, how can we take what we've learned from PrEP and, and from these pivots during the COVID-19 response and apply to those coming down the pipe? I mean, I think for, uh, for me, the thing that I've seen is, uh, you know, a disaster like uh, 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 COVID uh, does not actually destroy you. I think it makes you stronger. It makes you think beyond what you, you do on a daily basis. Uh, because uh, like Masa was saying, I think there has been, there have been some innovations uh, because of COVID. Uh, because we cannot let our friends and uh, our, you know, people who are out there uh, just not access services. They have to continue ac uh, accessing those services. And so how do you work uh, with the people, the providers? How do you work with the people in the community? How do you work with MOH? Even, even, our, uh, even USAID, how do you actually approach people? So you have to think beyond the box. You have to think outside the box to be able to, to do your work. And I think that's what has managed, that's why we have managed actually to still uh, get our numbers, uh, give services to the people, uh, because we have gone beyond the box. Like I was saying, you don't just stay because I'm staying at home, I'm working from home. I cannot reach out to the people in the community. So I think for me, whatever comes, I think we know that we are people that can do more than what we think we can do. I think it's there. Oh, so true, Doc, so, so true. And maybe just building on that, um, I think for me, uh, again, going to that individual, um, it really starts with the people. Um, it starts with, yeah, it starts with the people, it starts with your mindset. The strength of our PrEP program really has been that HCD. The strength of it really came through from going and going with an open mind to say, how can we serve you better? And that, um, and that respect, that kind of, um, uh, yeah, that respect and that really idea that we really want to help these individuals access their much needed services, I believe is mm -hmm. what has really helped us give us the, the stability and also the capacity to pivot 
in terms of our programs. So as we, and we have heard young women say they want, and, and young men or others as well, talk about wanting greater choice in terms of the biomedical prevention choices. If we continue in that trajectory where we're, we go back to these individuals and maybe this time we have to do it differently. Maybe we have to do surveys, we have to do different types of um, um, ways, but we still, the fundamental thing is we have to go back to the people to understand how can we best bring this uh, service to you? Where is it best delivered and so on? Um, I think that will really be what will guide us. So, so um, yeah, so I think PrEP uh, and this, this, sorry, this space has taught us about resilience and, um, and maybe, and also thinking outside the box. And I think that's what, those are the type of tools that we'll certainly need as we move um, into this new space, uh, hopefully soon with these more prevention choices available for people that need them. But also maybe in addition to that, I think building systems uh, right from the beginning. I think we have been helped uh, uh, very much, especially with PrEP, that systems were already uh, built. Uh, the PrEP management information system has helped us very much. I don't know what would have happened if we didn't have that system in place. Uh, mm. I think the use of technology has helped mm. us a lot. That You don't have to be there. Wherever mm. you are, you are able to do things and you, can, you are able to get results. I think this has really helped us in these days of COVID. So, so true. I think those are really great concluding remarks from both of you. Um, Mwanza, I love that you always keep our program people focused and noting the resilience. Um, Dr. Mutinta, I love your optimism and, and seeing this, the need for systems, but also seeing the opportunities of how we can operate under this new environment, because sadly, I don't think COVID is going anywhere for some time. Um, it's really been a pleasure speaking with both of you. Um, I'm going to wrap us up and um, we're going to embed this link with as well as some resources from the USAID Discover Health project in, in with the blog. So um, I just want to thank you again for your time and for sharing your experiences with everyone. Thank you so thank much, you Sean. Thank you, Sean. You have a good day.